What identifies uh, indigenous people? What identifies native people? It's how we identify to the land and how we use it and what we do. The, our culture, the things that we use that nobody, no other culture uses. It's everything that makes that person that person. Uh, you know, what they use, the environment they live in and how they wrap themselves in it and use it to sustain life, to make them resilient to that area. I want people to realize that we need to fight and keep and maintain what we have because this is who we are. We're the United Human Nation and this is our land and we want to fight for every piece of it and keep it as long as we can. Come on, little girl. There you go. You want to see some apples in here? Yeah. I mean, I'm a Homa tribe member. It goes way, way back, deep, deep, you, you know. You can leave it right there for right now. We're going to pick that up on the way out, all right? Let's go see what we can find. When I was a young kid, I had uh, started cleaning up this place right here so we can enjoy it. And then when I got older, I decided to, uh, I wanted to purchase that property. So I want that place because I knew all about it. I'm next door to the place where I had grown up at, and it's called the Indian Hill. When I was purchasing, purchasing the land, I had asked the man, see if I can build a little bridge and go clean it up over there. He said, yeah, sure. Once the grounds look better, it makes us happy. And that's one of the things that uh, people need to recognize is where their foundation is. And this is part of me and Arbor's foundation right here. Even though we don't own it, but we, you know, we want to treasure it as much as we can. I feel like these are my roots. Being, living next to the mound, these are my ancestors. You know, they were here way before we were even here. A lot of people ask, are, are you afraid to live next to the mound? I said, no, my ancestors won't bother me because I am them. So earthen and shell mounds are built by humans, by people, one basket load of earth at a time. I think it's absolutely reasonable to say that the ancestors of the modern day Homa were a part of that whole landscape of native cultures uh, who, who lived in this region and who built mounds. So based on pottery and based on charcoal and wood that we radiocarbon dated, we know that the mound is between uh, 900 and 700 years old. We're looking for the texture. We want to know what kind of soil or sediment the mound was built out of. And then we're also looking for 
any kind of artifacts or things that can tell us about the people that are in that sediment too. One of the things about soils, right, is Liz knows the natural sequences really well. Like anything that's out of the ordinary is out of the ordinary for a reason. And this is out of the ordinary because of human intervention. We have this idea that the building of mounds and the way in which people constructed them, native societies constructed them, um, was a way of building their community. In only a few places in the world do we have evidence of, uh, of human societies building uh, monumental infrastructure before the advent or development of agriculture. We have some evidence in coastal Peru and here in coastal Louisiana. The challenge is the coast is covered in archaeological sites, hundreds of Native American mounds. And many of them are threatened by rising sea levels, by subsiding land, by erosion. And these impacts will cause us to lose our coastal heritage. I think it's really important that we think about everything that's on this coast as a resource that's necessary or worthy of protection. Um, because if we don't at least make efforts now in some way, shape, or form, we'll lose that heritage, we'll lose that history. Um, and if we lose it, it'll be gone and we can't get it back. Mountain creation in this region and in, in this area, we do know where a lot of them are. That was their religious site, their burial site. We've lived in this area for 300 something years and I tell everybody, you know, that we identify to the land, but the, uh, the land identifies who we are. Leeville, they had a cemetery right where the new bridge is at. It's no longer there. They had to re-intern the uh, citizens from there and move them because the land was washing away. Right now, the island, we have a cemetery that's on the island where a lot of our relatives are buried, you know? So what do you do about the cemetery? So all this land is very important to United Homer Nation because this is where we live. This is where our citizens reside at. So we want to make sure that we represent all their interests and all their land. What are we cooking? Mother chicken breast. This ain't got time for it right now. We don't, we won't leave until the, the land's gone. I'm not leaving, the, the gulf could be right here. I'm staying until my land is gone, if it has to go. But as long as there's land, I'm staying. But I don't know, you know, it's scary not, the not knowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went, we went to a, a meeting. meeting. We went to a couple you know, of meetings. They, we to they, to they meeting. told us all this. We're hoping yeah. it's true. Comes to life. That's just a plan. Put it to life. Then, then we'll be happy. I mean, you can plan, yeah. plan, plan. What good the plan's gonna do if you don't put it to life? I'm great. I'm thankful they have a plan. But let's do it. Don't talk about it. Do it. So, it, we just started the talk. We want action. You know. Okay, we're currently at the discharge point for the Bayou Bonfuca Marsh Creation Project. The, the dredge, which is out in the lake, is currently pumping mud and sediment approximately 5,000 feet to this point right here where you can see it coming out. In this cell here, we're creating about 350 acres of marsh. Marsh is really important as a buffer. You know, you look south of New Orleans and south of these uh, co big communities, Homa and places like that. I mean, there used to be miles and miles of solid marsh. And it was really the cushion against the storm surge coming in with those hurricanes. It would absorb the wave energy as the surge came in. Without that, I mean, we turn into open water and that water just kind of crashes in and hits us like a tsunami. There is a great sense of urgency 
about what's happening on the coast. We have to rebuild and we have to rebuild now. There's still a window of opportunity that we can build enough back and start to make a difference. We're still going to lose some land, but you know, uh, if we can go from losing a football field an hour to losing a football field a day, I mean, that's worthwhile. When Hurricane Katrina came through and washed out most of this marsh, it created breaches in a natural lake ground. Those breaches allow tidal flow to come in and out, in and out, bringing salt water with it, but also scouring the vegetation and land that's there now. So in total, we're going to spend about $23 million to create 620 acres of confined marsh and another estimated 300 acres of semi-confined marsh. There's a thing that the state uses pretty good, cost-benefit ratio. So, and that's what we alluded to earlier in your conversation was, where's the value? Where's the, who puts the value on these things? Is it, is, if it's a bird and it's in danger, they're gonna do everything in their will and their power to save that habitat for that bird. Human, oh, they can relocate, they can move. So until we put the same value on an endangered species, bird, whatever, any animal you choose, and put that same value on culture and a human life, then nothing will change. So unless they change the value system, we will always be the sacrificial lamb. And culture and indigenous people will always pay the ultimate price. We want to protect everybody, but some people are going to look at it on the, the cost-benefit ratio, and they're going to go on how many per people are protected for these dollars. People, jobs, industry, um, schools, fisheries. I mean, all these have to go into the model for the model to have any, uh, you know, any reality to it. Now, the more cultural and historic data that we have and, uh, and, and sensitive sites that we can put into this, the better. But exactly how those models work, I'm, I don't know. It's supercomputers, come on. <laughs> Every historic place is priceless. But so is this marsh is priceless. You lose it, it may not be able to come back. We may never be able to recreate it. How do you put a price on people's hopes and dreams for their children, their grandchildren, for the future of this state, for us to continue to live the life that we have lived so traditionally? Uh, it's hard to put a dollar value on that. Look at all this, you have to visualize in your mind if you can, a whole village right here. And we were a hidden nation because we were way down here, way back here, you know, for many centuries. And as you can see, there's another cemetery right there. And that was all hard ground at one time, all covered with trees and everything else. And they had a village all back this way. I remember this bayou, this boat, this bayou wasn't wider than this boat. It's, you know, when you look at this and you try to paint a picture for people and you try to tell them this is what life was back in the day and they look at this right now and you say really and, and it, it what but the only thing that you can relate to and to see you know oak trees have to be on hard fertile ground to grow these are not willow trees these are not trees that just can live in cypress trees that can live in water these are oak tree skeletons that you see 
along here, and it's as far back as you can see in here. These are oak trees. So that tells you, at one time, all of this was hard ground. If nothing else is done to the rest, for the rest of the state, this is what it's going to look like in a very short time. Like I told you before, I'm only 61 years old, and this has all happened in my lifetime. And I hate this, you know, I bring my grandkids here to show them and tell them this, that this is where we used to live, run and play. And now, you know, nobody lives here. The trees are even dying, you know. And when you look out across here and you see this, it just wrenches your heart, you know, to know that if nothing else is done to protect the rest of the, the civilization, civilization this way, this is what it's going to look like for them in a very short, that 100-year plan, 50-year plan, this is what it could look like in Homer in 50 years if nothing else is done.